Hi, I'm David Zyla, and welcome to another edition of Feel Good Beauty. So if you'd like to watch other episodes, uh, you can go to my YouTube channel, and we have a, a few of, uh, other episodes posted there. So first off, what is Feel Good Beauty? So Feel Good Beauty is not about chasing trends, transforming yourself into an ideal, or even shifting one inch out of your comfort zone. It's all about identifying and magnifying the unique individual and beautiful woman that you are. So today, we are going to feel good with some experts, um, and we're going to learn how to organize your makeup to ensure a stress-free morning with the no-nonsense home organization plan author, Kim Davidson Jones. We're gonna learn how to set a beautiful table with acclaimed event and interior designer, Rebecca Gardner. And we're gonna improve our balance with Better Balance for Life, best-selling author, Carol Clements. But, First, let's talk about your style archetype. So if we could go to the first slide. Finding the best colors to wear truly can be life-changing. They empower you as the subject of the great portrait painting surrounded by the most beautiful, flattering colors that illuminate you. However, just like people look best in different colors. There are also different textures, prints, designs, and specific historical references that really illuminate them more than others. So have you ever remarked that uh, you have a friend who looks really good, fresh-faced in a t-shirt, plain t-shirt, and she looks so beautiful, but yet another friend would not look like herself without full makeup and an abundance of accessories. Um, that would mean that those two friends are different archetypes. And I'll, I'm gonna explain a little bit more about archetypes in a moment. Um, the same is true if both of you try on the same dress. Why does it flatter one and not the other? It's the same reason, you're different archetypes. So if we could go to uh, my the next slide. So in my book, Color Your Style, I first teach you how to find your true colors. These are the colors based on your eyes, hair, and skin. And I have information on how to use this um, uh, to lead you to one of 24 archetypes in my book, from the life of the party to the divine diva. But as I know that objectivity is tricky, especially if you're working on this project on your own. Uh, I wanna share some additional ideas on how to get your, your uh, archetype nailed down. So if we could go to the next slide. So remember that I said we all look great in different colors and styles. Um, this is why discovering your archetype um, as well as your true colors is so important. So here's a really good example. So here is how one of the archetypes, a classic summer, would wear the colors navy or inky blue. Um, and you notice everything is wrapped and draped and there's a gentleness to it all. And there's even some transparency to the chiffon cape here. So let's contrast that with, next slide please. This is navy blue and ink, um, how the sexy librarian or mellow autumn would wear the same range of colors. Um, so you'll likely find it really helpful to think about how you would and wouldn't wear the colors that you discover that look best on you. That's going to help you get close to your archetype. Um, if you just do a compare and contrast, if you say from the images I just showed you, oh, that dress I would wear, this other one I would not. That was really helpful. Oftentimes in life, knowing what isn't right is, is actually more helpful than knowing what's right. Um, so uh, this is going to help uh, narrow down the archetype possibilities. So if we could go to the next slide. It's time to go to your closet. So 
here's another exercise. If we could go to the next slide. So I want you to survey your entire closet and look for like five to eight pieces from your wardrobe that you feel really define you. Um, you might say that, uh, you know, they're my favorite items, but now that I've gone through this process of learning my colors, you know, they're not exactly right color-wise, but, but, but style-wise, fabric, um, the, the details, the fit, they really feel like you. And if that's the case for this exercise, I'm going to ask you, next slide, please, um, to photograph the pieces and then use a black and white filter. That way you're not going to be distracted by a, a color that you know isn't quite right yet the, you feel the piece is good. Um, and you, this way you're, you're going to be able to look at the shape, the fabric, the cut, and the details. And so then I want you to ask yourself, what are the common threads in these items? And what story do these clothes tell? Um, if we could go to the next slide. And I'm gonna ask you to come up with five words to describe these clothes. Um, and if we could go to the next slide. And then I'm going to ask you, um, you know, take these words and think about and then look at the clothes and think about who is the character in a movie that would wear these clothes and that those words would suit. Um, and notice that I say character in a movie. I don't want you to look at actresses because, you know, an actress is, is often transforming herself to play a variety of roles. And that might throw you a little bit. Um, so, let, so let's just say as an example, that you, you think long and hard about, you know, who would wear these clothes, who this character is. You come up with a quirky scientist who abhors a dress code, you know, something like that. I want you to come up with, you know, not someone who, you know, uh, I would say like something a little bit insightful, like that would be great. Um, and then you can use my Pinterest boards to then help you costume this character in the film and narrow down potential archetypes. Um, also, you can look for your five words or synonyms for them in the descriptions of the 24 archetypes in my book. So remember that list earlier, um, the words I had there were unexpected, contradictory, eclectic, alert, and cute. And I guarantee you that those words, if those were your words, um, they would lead you to the color your style archetype of, next slide, Maverick Spring, uh, the Maverick or Tawny Spring. Uh, you can also look at this board of pins and see that the description of quirky scientist who abhors a dress code would fit in perfectly with this archetype. Um, I also would say that it would be less of a fit with, next slide, the earthy philosophy, philosopher or vivid winter. Um, this is, you know, uh, again, what I said earlier, it's easy, it's it's often easy to see what doesn't fit. So if you're going through um, you, the, the different archetypes and trying to discern which one is right for you, those are two ways, both this character in a movie and the words that can get you close to it um, and help you narrow them down significantly and probably find it rather quickly. Um, so again, earthy philosopher, Probably not. Probably doesn't connect with those words or that description of the character. So um, anyway, so that that's um, a little bit more information on how to discover your uh, archetype along with your true colors. And if we could go to the next slide. And if you want more information about me and my books, um, or follow me, uh, here's my information. So, 
Onward. Um, very excited about our wonderful guests that we have with us today. Next, we have, uh, we're going to get organized today. We're going to get very organized. A lot of people are going back to work at this moment and, uh, and all of a sudden say, wow, I want to, you know, I, I've been at home a while and when I'm getting ready to go out, I need to, I need to get things a little bit more organized. I need to time manage a little bit better. And we have the perfect person today for that. So let me tell you a little bit about her. Kim Davidson Jones is the founder of Lock and Key Home and the author of the No Nonsense Home Organization Plan. So after having twins, her life was completely turned upside down when she went from being a very organized person to barely keeping her head above water. After the twins turned one, she decided something had to give, and it did. Kim went from researching and practicing in her home, creating systems to maintain organization and switching her mindset around stuff, to then helping clients get organized and live simplified, happier lives. She has been featured in several national publications to help others get organized, like todayshow.com, Bare Minerals, Redfin, Kentucky Living Magazine, and many others. Without further ado, welcome Kim Davidson Jones. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Well, thank you for joining us. And so Kim, I have so many questions. You're going to help <laughs> us all so much and just shifting our mindsets to get a little bit more organized. So mornings are are typically a really busy time in a household. And, and I know you have some great advice on saving time. And, and part of it is all about organizing your makeup. You've, you've got to tell us more about this. Yes. So as a mom, I often will put the kids first and I run out the door sometimes in looking very haphazard, not feeling my best by any means. Um, so if you have a morning routine and a process, it's almost like you could do it with your eyes closed. So you just walk through the process and it's very, very structured. There's no question mark about what am I doing next? And you're basically trying to maximize as much time as you can, because you usually don't have a ton of time in the morning, sit around, drink coffee and watch the Today Show like we did during the quarantine. Um, it's move, 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 get everyone out the door. And sometimes it feels almost like a hurricane. So it was interesting because I had not done my makeup or really even put on jeans for three months. So last week when I had to go to like my first real meeting, I had to reteach myself the routine because I didn't know, I couldn't, I didn't grab where everything was automatically like normal. So it's really about having a system in place for you and what works. Um, and giving everything a home. So if it's your foundation, put it with your foundation, keep it kind of streamlined on how you put everything on. And you literally can do it in your sleep. Um, it's amazing, you're not digging, you're not going through drawers, trying to find your perfect lipstick or your eyeliner and looking half done when you walk out the door, you will have the perfect look because you have everything exactly where you need it. So, so walk us through this. What, what is, how, how, do, how does one start to organize this? Yeah, so really the easiest way to do it is to get all of your makeup out and put it into categories. So some, you know, women have their going out makeup versus their everyday makeup. So keep that going out, make it separate. I keep it in a drawer. Drawer organizers are amazing because it keeps everything nice and tidy. So if you're just looking for specific blush, you just go grab the blush versus digging through everything, trying to find this blush with all your other makeup. Um, I usually don't like a lot of stuff on the countertops because I think it has a sense of calmness in the morning if you're not surrounded by stuff. But I do love having a makeup organizer, especially for your everyday makeup and everything categorized in its own. So if you want a lipstick, you go straight to the lipstick and you're not dealing with all the other makeup. Um, and even putting it in a streamlined process, it just it makes things so much more simple. It seems very like not a big deal, but it's the biggest difference in the world, especially getting out the door in the morning. So it sounds like you're not into having a makeup bag, but more like, Absolutely. A drawer or some kind of surface? 
Yes, yeah, makeup organizers are perfect. Keep it simple um, and don't mix if you have a ton of makeup, like a costume makeup or go out makeup, keep that separate and not in an everyday spot. Um, it's interesting when I travel, I have my makeup bag. But the first thing I do when I get to a hotel or wherever I'm getting is I set everything out. I get it out of the bag because there's nothing worse than like trying to get something and you're digging and then you start sweating and it's a whole thing. So making it as simple as possible for yourself and it takes five minutes, even when you're traveling, just to get everything and just lay it out on the counter neatly and everything kind of in its place. So, all right, one question with all of this. I, I know that a lot of women, once they buy something, mm -hmm. even if they've only worn it once or twice, it's still around. It's like it's like they've befriended it for life and that compact is still there. Mm -hmm. What what can our, our watchers uh, do to um, keep things a little bit more updated and to, um, you know, obviously reduce the clutter? Yes. So it's interesting because makeup expires. So like mascara will only last for six months. So there's really no need to keep five different mascaras, especially if you're only using one primarily. Um, so it is, less is always more, less is definitely more when it comes to makeup because you can keep track of what's fresh and what's not fresh. So a lot of times women go out and buy, you know, this perfect compact and they think it's gonna be perfect, but it just doesn't work, but they keep it because they spent so much money on it and they just tuck it in the drawer and think maybe one day I'm gonna use it, never do. So be real with yourself. If it doesn't work, let it go. You're not saving yourself any money by tucking it in the drawer. A lot of women's shelters will take makeup, which is fabulous. So you can give it to someone who's really gonna use it instead of collecting dust in your drawer. Great, great advice, great tip. So you had said, first step is put all the makeup into categories. Yes. What's the step after that? The step after that is giving everything a home. So I label like a maniac, which a lot of people think it's a little overboard, which it may be. I may be a little overboard on that, but you want to make but it- But you're, you're a famous organizer, so yeah. this makes total sense. <laughs> we want you to be like this, yeah. yeah. It's just, there's no thought process. And in the morning when you're getting ready, you're tired and you're just kind of sluggish, if everything is labeled and it's in a home, you don't have to think about where to put it. So it's automatic when you put the makeup on, you also put the makeup right back in its spot so that when you come home at the end of the day, you don't have a huge mess like you just tornadoed and ran out of the bathroom when you were done. So it works for two different reasons, getting ready in the morning, but also not having to clean up your mess. Okay, all right, great advice. Because who wants to come back to, yeah, the pandemonium? And yeah. that's awful, awful, awful thing to walk back to. Yes. All right, so you've got that going on. Then, um, how, what, what is your best tip on, uh, how would I say, like keeping the system going? Because I think a lot of us will create a system, mm -hmm. we'll try it once or twice, we then have the day or two where we slip and we don't put things away and fast forward two weeks later we're kind of doing it but we're kind of not how, how do we stay in in the routine in the routine so it's interesting because a routine usually takes around 21 days to really become something that's ingrained and natural to you um, but the easiest way to do the routine with the organization is setting up systems that work for you so don't set up a system that you maybe saw on Pinterest that works for someone else. You have to set something up that is specific to you and your lifestyle. So if you have a container and it has a lid on it and you don't have time in the morning to literally take the lid off and put it back and put it back in its nice little spot, that's not gonna work. So makeup organizers and specifically, they're so easy because you just put it right back. It's just as easy to put it back as it is to lay it on the counter. So make it as easy as possible. Make sure it's working for your lifestyle. Um, shoes are like a huge thing. People are like, my husband will never ever put his shoes where they belong. But if you give him a basket and he can literally just kick off his shoes when he walks in the door, they're organized, right? It doesn't have to be Pinterest perfect. It just has to be what works for you. And it makes it super easy if you give yourself a way to put it back as easy as you found it. 
That is wonderful advice because I think a lot of us, you know, there's this idea of, you know, we want every moment of our lives to be sort of magazine perfect. And if we can't get there, we don't play at all. Yeah. Um, and so thank you for giving us that tip that, that literally it's like, no, whatever works for you. Yes. Um, that's yes. Fantastic. And also 21 days, who knew? Yeah. Um, and that's, that's wonderful because I think a lot of us too might try something for a few days and, you know, two days are good, one day is bad. Um, that's wonderful to know that we've, we've got kind of that period to figure it out. Yeah. Um, so Kim, what are some other things that you would say that we can do in our mornings um, could, to jumpstart the day, to, to make things a little bit easier and uh, to make that period more efficient? Yeah, so I'm all about the morning routine and having every single thing mapped out so that you know what is going to be and there's no curveballs thrown your way. Um, so in the morning routine, the first thing, waking up in the morning, if you're waking up to a ton of clutter in your bedroom, you're already waking up stressed and a little bit anxious. So make sure that your bedroom is a super calming way to wake up and you're just going to get started on the right foot. Um, the other thing, your, your beautiful closet picture that you showed earlier, you want to feel like you're shopping in a boutique every single morning because you want to feel your best. And if you're having to dig through your frumpy clothes or the clothes that someone gave you, you feel guilty for giving away, those are bringing you down. You want to just have the items that make you feel like you're going to go out and kill it that day. Um, and it's just walking through your routine, walking into the bathroom and everything's simple. Here's my hairbrush. I'm going to brush my hair. Here's my blow dryer. Even in the shower, if you're trying to find something, you get panicked and you get stressed out. And I feel like if I get panicked and stressed out, it carries with me the entire day. So sometimes I even have to take a moment before I put my feet on the ground, have a little self-talk like today's going to be a good day. Here's what I'm grateful for and it will set the tone for the day. Um, and it's just, it's so important to wake up calm and feeling like you're in control. If you wake up and you feel like when you oversleep and your alarms got off and you feel like you're gonna miss a meeting, you wake up and your complete panic and your entire day is gonna be that tone. Well, you had said, one of, one of the quotes I have from you is that organ, being organized makes us happy. Um, and it sounds like, you know, that's exactly what you're saying right now, that it's like it really can affect your entire day and probably impact whatever situations you're dealing with in a day, like an important meeting or, or a date or whatever it is, yes. um, that, that literally being organized will uh, help, um, help, you know, hopefully give us a little bit more success um, with, with anything we need to do. It's a complete it, It's process. extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it is, yeah. Um, so how much time, so, so if one is going to organize their, let's say makeup, how much time, you know, is this like an hour project? Is this a half hour project? So makeup is usually not too bad. Um, and it, you can get away with very inexpensive items to keep yourself organized. I think people sometimes think they have to have the top notch makeup organizer or they do nothing at all. You can use whatever works for you. Um, even if it's like a little piece of cardboard to keep your drawers organized, it doesn't matter. It just needs to work. Um, so makeup organization won't take long. And the thing about keeping it up is that you know when things are expiring and when they need to let go. If you keep letting things pile up and pile up and pile up, it's going to take hours to go through it versus staying on top of it. Um, so makeup organization is a great place to start. The bathroom alone is a great place to start because it's usually one of the first places you go in the morning. So do you think, you know, in starting all of this, do you suggest that we you know, kind of uh, take some time and map out what we do every morning and then kind of work backwards. Is that the process? Yes, I always say, you know, especially like in your closet or in your bathroom, what do you wear every day? Are you wearing suits? Are you wearing jeans? If you're wearing jeans, that needs to be first and front. Suits can go elsewhere because <laughs> you're never wearing them. So don't let them block you out. Um, so yeah, mapping out what you're doing and it's, it's just almost, it gets to the point where your hands just start moving and you don't even know what you're doing. 
kind of like your drive to work, you're like, how did I get here? It's the exact same thing with makeup. You get so used to it and you know exactly where everything is because it's ingrained and it doesn't move on you, it doesn't disappear, and it just becomes a natural process. Great, great. Well, thank you for that. Um, what can, what do you find? I've been so curious. I was so excited about talking to you because this was the, the, my big question I wanted to ask you. What do you find is the most common area of disorganization in a home? Um, it's interesting. I did a presentation in Dallas and I, it was a group of moms. So I gave them three choices of what they wanted to talk about. I thought for sure it was gonna be the kitchen because the kitchen is your hub of your home. It's where everyone's coming and going. Um, and I also gave the option of playroom and closet unanimously won. Um, and I think it's because a lot of women have their first floor. If you have like, you know, they have their main part of their house very put together, but they also have the Monica closet where they've shoved everything in there and they're not happy about it. And also like often it is their personal closet because they never take the time to get themselves organized. They're worried about their husbands or their significant others or their kids and their kids have everything perfectly placed. But then when you walk into their bedroom, their closet's a disaster. Wow. And, and it's like that, that backstage that you just don't want to yes. deal with. Right. Yeah. Yes. It is one of the first things you see in the morning and it is the best way of it's a form of self care to make yourself feel really, really good. Because if you're going in and grabbing whatever clothes you can find and you're not, you know, just skipping makeup altogether because you don't even want to deal with that hot mess. You're, you're <laughs> walking out the door feeling frumpy and not as best as you can be. And I think that exerts in your personality. It exerts in your confidence level. And you're just, that's, you're just going to walk through the day like you're frumpy and you don't want anyone to see you when in reality, you probably have a lot to offer and you need to, you know, bring your best self to the table. Fantastic. So, all right. So Kim, were you like the super organized little girl? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Come on, give us an example. Um, so I had to share a bathroom with my brother. That's the reason my family was very chaotic. Um, my mom loved stuff and there was stuff everywhere. It was just the whole house I felt like was always just a, looked like a tornado. And it made me feel really, really crazy, especially having to share a bathroom with a brother who kept taking all my towels. He would just use my toothbrush. Um, to really date myself, he would wash his fingernails on my little Clinique face soap, and it just drove me nuts. So I made my bedroom my own personal sanctuary, and I would have all of my clothes color-coded. I would have all my CDs in alphabetical order, but it was my way to bring calm to a very non-calm family. They're always on the go. Um, my brother was in every single sport you could imagine. So it was, you know, practices here, practices there. And that was my way to control the way that I wanted to present myself and also how I wanted to live. Didn't want to feel chaotic. That's a whole different ball game, feeling like your entire life is just crazy. And I just wanted to be very in control and organization gave me that. It's a sense of calming um, and just a sense of just feeling like you can rest and read a book and not be surrounded by a bunch of clothes or anything else. So yes. <laughs> I know. So we have to thank your brother for your fabulous book. <laughs> I have to thank my brother, yes, because he is the one that made me like, I had to keep everything separate from him or it would become a disaster. So yes, he is my credit. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's a great, thank you for sharing that story. <laughs> So Kim, to, if, if today, after, after this event, if we wanted to take 15 minutes and empower ourselves um, tomorrow by organizing something today, yes. what, what, give us, give us a, something that we could do. I always say start with something that's not emotional. So don't start with your pictures or you're gonna set yourself up for failure. Um, start in the kitchen because that's usually pretty, very black and white. So start with the refrigerator, go through it. And if it's expired, let it go. So you don't have to think about the process, pull everything out, categorize it, anything that's expired, out you go. 
and then put everything back the way that you want to see it and the way that works for you. So the kitchen can take 15 or the refrigerator will take 15 minutes and it, it's a game changer. And then you get addicted and then you're like, I need the entire kitchen to be like this. So then you can move on to your junk drawer and make it a non-junk drawer, just maybe a miscellaneous drawer. Um, go to your freezer and just start to build up easier and easier until you're ready to really tackle the hard obstacle. And, and one other question. So for the person that says, um, I'm bad at organizing, what, what, how, how, can they, how can we help them? How can we change that mindset? Yeah, so no one's bad at organizing. You just haven't figured out a system that works for you. So I think the perfect example is toddlers. Even when my kids were like one, they had no clue what it meant to be organized, but I gave them a system that was so simple that even they could put their things away. You know, whether it is a huge basket so you can't miss it, so at the end of the day, there goes their toys, it's making it as simple as possible, but also making it work for you. So don't set yourself up for failure with elaborate schemes or something that's gonna be complicated. Just make it as simple as possible. Um, and the shoes are the perfect example. Give yourself an easy out. You don't need to take an extra 20 minutes to put them neatly in their little shoe bin when you can just drop them in a basket. It may not be the prettiest thing on earth, but they're contained. It's a lot more organized than having them all around the house. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so we have a couple of questions about um, uh, makeup organization. Okay. And uh, wondering if you have examples of uh, systems that, that you recommend, and also if you uh, can recommend any images of uh, a, a good makeup system. Yeah, um, so I do have images on my Instagram page, which is Lock and Key Home. Um, yeah, so it, the systems are just keep it as simple as possible. So don't put a lot of effort or try to make it more complicated than it needs to be. If you only use three things on a daily basis, keep the three things on your countertop, put the rest in a drawer organizer. Um, make it work for you. Don't Sometimes people think, oh, I'm going to get up and do full makeup, but every single day they get up and do mascara and lip gloss. That's fine. Keep your mascara and lip gloss on the countertop and a makeup organizer and make it as easy as possible for you. Thank you so much. Um, so Kim, how, how can we uh, find out more about you? Um, well, my website is uh, lkhomeorganization.com. I'm on Instagram. Uh, Pinterest and Facebook as Lock and Key Home. And I also okay. have a YouTube page, which I'm building and trying to show people really how to do it and break it down step by step. Because sometimes you build it in your head and you think it's going to take a lot longer. It's going to be a lot more difficult. But 15 minutes is the perfect amount of time to get started. Fantastic. Fantastic. And, uh, and we also, and your book uh, is available anywhere. Yes. And the full title one more time. There it is. The No Nonsense Home Organization Plan. And it breaks down your entire house in seven weeks. So it tells you every single day, 30 to 45 minutes, if you know, just set that time aside and you can do your entire house, including the garage and the basement, which are usually areas people don't even get to their entire life. And it's very simple. Um, Saturdays are a little bit of a bigger project, but you can do this baby step for seven weeks and then turn around and your entire house is organized. Kim, you have inspired all of us today. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> to live happier lives because we're organized. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and we so appreciate me. all of your fabulous advice. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you. So next um, we have Rebecca Gardner. Uh, if you've ever seen Rebecca Gardner on Instagram, if you haven't, well, I should put it this way, if you haven't, you must. Um, Rebecca Gardner is the founder and creative director of Houses and Parties, a full service event and interiors design collective in Savannah and New York City. She has been named a top event designer by Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, and Southern Living. Her design work 
was pub has been published uh, and featured in the Wall Street Journal, Architectural Digest, Town and Country, and the New York Times. Rebecca established her design firm in 2010, and a decade later is applying her learned magic to create House and Parties, an online retail destination for creating seasonal occasions at home. Rebecca Gardner, welcome. Thank you, David. I'm so glad to be here. This is fun. I, I, am, I feel like I need to rush out of this and organize my uh, bathroom. You know, I can't imagine with, with a company that like the scale that you have and the amount of things you must need. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I, I'm a hoarder of beautiful I, things. <laughs> I'm sure organization is a daily part of your life just to keep it all together. Um, so Rebecca, you of anyone I know on the planet know how to set a beautiful table. Um, you really do. And I'm wondering if you would, um, before we get to some of your fabulous images, I, I'm wondering if you would just share with us first, what would you say is the most important element of setting uh, an authentic and hospitable table? Um, I think lighting is more important than anything. I think it's more important than what you serve. It's more important than what china you use because you want people to um be in a flattering light because if you feel better you're more fun and ultimately being fun is the best party right no matter how beautiful it is you want people to drink wine and you know um feel relaxed and have a good time that that's an unexpected answer and it's fantastic thank you um what, um, so what's your take on tradition? Well, I always tell clients that we build parties um, within a structure of traditional good taste, but I demand that there are irreverent twists and um, surprises uh, within that. Otherwise, um, it's boring. And you don't want to be boring. <laughs> no, no. I mean, if we do all kinds of parties. We do small dinners for brands, um, really for content, and we do huge weddings. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it depends. So, Rebecca, um, I'm wondering if you would share your images with us um, sure. and, and give us a little bit of insight on, you know, what goes into creating you know, a, a gorgeous table and obviously, you know, impacting uh, a fabulous time as well. Sure, well, I was thinking before, um, before this week and, and as I put together this presentation, um, how important it is that, especially in this time during this pandemic, that we all become more comfortable entertaining in our homes. Um, it's my love language and it's my passion. It's also my business, but entertaining in your home, I think will be the way that we keep each other together and, and having a good time when we can't go to restaurants or when we can't gather with, with um, groups, big groups of people. So I think in the next year, this will be really important. And, um, and I think it's fun and entertaining in your home is very vulnerable. Um, it, it can be intimidating, you know, am I a great cook? Um, does the chandelier in the dining room have much dust? Do I need to throw my dirty clothes in the, in the tub upstairs and close the, the curtain? I, you know, I don't know. We'd probably have to go back for Kim for a, a lashing um, about all of that. But um, I think what's important is just that you're, you're creating an environment that's fun and you're sharing something with your friends. So these are sort of my suggestions outside of a normal, um, this is what you should serve and be sure to light candles. Um, these are my ideas for shaking it up and encouraging everyone to have people at their houses. So the, the first um, point or reminder would be on the next slide, which is to consider a new venue. And um, I think it's, uh, it makes it more fun and more interesting to change where you're entertaining. So you don't always wanna be in your dining room. You might want to put a folding table in front of a sofa 
Um, I remember I had a house that was so small when I was right out of college that I would set up a bar in my bedroom because I wanted to have more people. Um, so if you go to the next slide, these are just some ideas of how you can rethink where you're entertaining. Um, especially during COVID, outdoors is where people like to play. This is a gas station that was turned into like a park and art installation um, in Chelsea, in New York. And it doesn't hurt that there's a flock of Lalan sheep, but I think that this is a fun way to show that you could invite a bunch of people. Um, this was actually done in the fall, so it was, it was cold. Um, and serve, you know, um, picnic food. And the next slide um, shows sort of the fun ways that you could do food that doesn't require a catering kitchen. So if you did want to invite people to a park, you can serve crudite, but make it wild like Mr. McGregor's garden or a picnic basket with um, you know, cured meats and a beautiful baguette. So all of that can be made ahead of time and taken to a new location. Next slide. This is just a picnic, but it's a picnic on acid. It's a, the best picnic you've ever seen. And these were cheap cupcake stands that we hot glued together from like, I don't know, Amazon. Um, but I think it looks really good with all these pillows that were, um, you know, just throw pillows that I pulled out of my house. And again, uh, when you're in a strange or new location, you wanna cook all the food ahead of time. Next slide. These are just details. Um, there was a fabulous saxophone player. This is in Savannah. And so we have all these beautiful squares downtown. And I happened to have a crumpled up $10 bill in the bottom of my purse. And I begged this man to play music. Um, and it made the whole thing. He was such a talented artist and um, it felt like it was synchronicity, but you know, it was forced magic. Um, and then again, just showing how the effort of bringing a good pitcher, water pitcher or bringing your good tumblers down to the park, even if it's just eight of them, it makes a huge difference because it shows effort and effort is ultimately the best gift, right? Time. Um, next slide. Uh, this was at my friend um, Mimi Kay's house in Savannah. She is a fabulous antique dealer. Everyone should follow her at Mimi Kay Antiques. And she has this great forest with camellias. And at the perfect time of year, it feels like a Tim Walker photograph. And so we set a table for a ladies luncheon, which I think a ladies luncheon now um, is the most decadent thing that you can do as very few ladies just lunch. So this was a really special occasion for a friend's birthday. Next slide. This is just to illustrate that you could throw a folding table in front of a sofa in a library. You could be in front of a fireplace somewhere. Rethink just the dining room. I mean, I use my dining room all the time. I have interior design clients that always say, well, I don't use a dining room. We eat in the kitchen. Well, help, then move your dining from the kitchen to the dining room, you know, but shake it up. And I think that this is fun for families who are staying at home. It's fun for couples to keep each other entertained. And it's also fun when you have a few friends over for dinner. So the next section um, is to reconsider the buffet. So often people roll their eyes with a buffet and they think of like, you know, Sunday brunches and people standing in line with white square plates in their hands, you know, or, or people serving out of shaving dishes. But a buffet is a great way to entertain a crowd for dinner without having to rent a bunch of tables or put things outside. It also allows people to meet and greet and not be stuck, you know, talking to the right or talking to the left. And it's a great way to focus all of your effort and all of your decor on one sort of BAM area. So if you go to the next slide, it'll show you some examples. This was a party that we did with a tropical theme. And um, I didn't even know that there was a such thing as a pineapple um, core driller, but we drilled all these pineapples and um, stuck palm leaves in the top and made this sort of garden of earthly delights. And when you make this much effort and it looks this good, it doesn't matter what you serve, you could order takeout. 
<laughs> Just make it look pretty. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, this was another buffet that we pulled every single piece of silver that we could find, like things that grandmothers had given you or things that you found at an antique store that you had to have. And we used them to style this table. And it was sort of a beauty and the beast decadence. But again, the food was really, really simple. And it was all about sort of this wow moment. Um, you'll notice I use fruit a lot. Um, you know, you don't always have to have a fortune in flowers. It's a great way to have color and texture and um, it feels a little gauguin, which I like. Next slide. Another buffet, this was for an afternoon tea. We set this as part of an ad campaign for Carolina Herrera. Um, you wanna choose food that doesn't get cold and it can sit out for at least an hour um, you know, a great thing about a cocktail buffet, or in this case, a tea party, is that people don't all eat at the same time. Um, so this, something like this, like an afternoon tea, is also a fun time to bring out an old-fashioned punch bowl and make it really boozy, and um, you hope people stay late. Next slide. Lanyap is a, a French word that you often hear in New Orleans for little extras. So it might be, um, you might be at a fresh fish fry and when you're done eating the fish out of the paper bag, the lanyap are those perfect little crunchy pieces down at the bottom of the bag. And we use this term a lot when planning events because we don't ever want the table to look like the caterer brought the flowers. So we like things to have fallen on the table. We like peonies that are so fat and so open that petals are you know down around your bread and butter plate and so these are just some examples um i think if, if i were a millennial i would say that this makes it extra so these are some examples to be extra um here i loved these glass bowls so much with these cheese straws um or i love the glass bowls so much i just made up the cheese straws would be on the table um and I decided to serve soup because my friend, again, Mimi, and, Mimi K and Mimi K Antiques had these fabulous soup spoons that I wanted to use. So anything that you can put on the table, whether it's a small Chinese dish for a butter pad or um, a bunch of clementines, it makes the table feel extra with lanyap. And the next slide. On the left, you see cherries and little pastel after dinner mints. And on the right was a party we did in Venice on the Grand Canal. And we used um, paper boats that were made out of Venetian paper. And our lanyap were seashells. And on the next slide, this is a, a table I set for Christmas. And I think popcorn, just microwave popcorn, as long as it's not the greasy kind, is so fun to pile on a table, whether you have these crazy fir tree candles um, or you use a gingerbread house, you know, whatever it is, I think popcorn can be magic snow and feel sort of nostalgic. Um, so the next slide starts my group of events. Uh, or my group of um, slides to show how dessert can be an event and uh, make sort of a climax at the end of your party. So it doesn't have to be some gigantic croque and bouche, but that would help. These are some ideas that I think you could do this at home. Next slide. This is this oversized cake that we did for a party for Love Shack Fancy and Erin Lauder, who you see pictured here. And we went to a local Italian bakery. They use all those fabulous colors and with those um, you know, candied fruit and brightly colored cherries. And they can really do something that feels a little kitsch and very, very joyful. And they made this gigantic heart-shaped cake. Um, this was to celebrate a collaboration of a perfume line between Love Shack and Aaron. And I think this cake might have cost $30, but it was the biggest hit of the party. Um, on the left shows sort of a fancy baked Alaska, but it doesn't matter what that tastes like as long as it has the sparkler in it. And anyone could do that at their house. Probably outside is best for this. And then on the right is a party trick that I use all the time at my house. I love to cook, but I don't love to cook the canapes, the starter, the entree, the sides, and the dessert. 
So if I put some real time into whatever I'm serving, I um, serve bluebell ice cream sandwiches for dessert and everyone leaves the table and I pass them around with fresh strawberries. Um, and in a way that is so ironic after a beautiful dinner that it too is an event. On the left, this is so beautiful, but it's really simple. It's flowers cut from a garden and pedophores from a bakery, chocolates and chocolate covered strawberries. Again, perfect for entertaining at home um, because you don't have to cook anything. It doesn't have to be at a certain temperature, but it looks really good. Um, and then on the right, these are things again from a bakery, which um, I encourage. Uh, and, you know, that server passing out those gigantic chocolate cream puffs, he's sly as a fox because everyone wanted one. And then my mantra for entertaining at home is really that you don't have to make it to make it happen. I think that there are a lot of people that um, are most comfortable ordering everything out and putting it on a good looking plate, um, but just pick and choose what you want to do so that it's joyful for you as well. And some tips for that are on the following slide. This is a beautiful table um, that we did last October and it was in Savannah. Savannah does not have the greatest resources as far as flowers. It's not like there's a 28th street. Um, so I bought orchids at the grocery store and then sort of the black sheep of the flower world carnations in bunches um, are cheap and cheerful and I think they look damn good here. Next slide. Um, Again, Home Depot plants and these great looking vines. I don't know if they're grapes or what. They're kind of weird little balls. I tore those down from my neighbor's house. I did ask first. Um, but again, you don't have to worry about some elaborate um, floral arrangement. Next. And then I hate canapes when you are entertaining at home. I think it's silly. I think it's awkward to either have a, if you're in someone's home to have a server or for you to walk around with a tray with little assembled things that fall apart when you take a bite. And so I serve really simple things like spiced pecans and cheese straws. And if you're absolutely starving, it'll tide you over until dinner. It's not totally bad to have a group of friends that are a little bit hungry when they sit down at your dinner table. Um, and all you need is a pretty bowl. And then my last slide is sort of shameful, but not, you know, there's nothing better than Kentucky Fried Chicken and there's nothing better than chicken with good dry champagne. Um, so I serve fried chicken all the time. And then Thai food and Chinese food keeps really well. So you could have it delivered 30 minutes before the party. I also think it's funny to have a dressy party and have the seamless or the Postmates guy arrive with dinner. I think that's surprising. Um, and those little containers that Asian food comes in are great for family style because they fit on the table. So those are my ideas and um, I hope that it encourages you to have people over um, as we feel more safe and comfortable and um, before we're back to business with um, with you know full restaurants opening and big parties and um really to create any sort of special occasion rebecca you have inspired us um <laughs> i've been doing a lot of talking david i'm sorry <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, so many phenomenal ideas and so many of them, I mean, all of them, we can do ourselves um, to create, you know, a little bit of theater in our homes or outside. Oh, I, love our that. I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fabulous. Um, so, so a couple questions for you. I'm dying to know what is the most, you, you talked about lighting being the most important thing, but I'm curious, what is the best table you've ever sat at that was not one of your own <laughs> and why? Um, I went to a party last year and really had a screaming blast because the hostess who was my friend, 
made such an effort with the seating chart to make sure that there were there was a good rhythm. So you can't have all of your people that are a screaming blast at one table. You can't have all the people that are left brain together and all the people that are right brain together. And so I think the greatest gift that you can give anyone is a new friend and to really be thoughtful with your guest list and make sure that you have a really great mix with different kinds of people. There's really an art to that, isn't it? Isn't there? I think so. I think so. Wow. That's so, that's, that's, it's so important. Um, and I'm curious, what, um, what's your best tip? You mentioned lighting earlier. What's your best tip specifically on lighting? Uh, candlelight. Candlelight, okay. As much candlelight as you can have. Uh, most people have tons of overhead light in their house, whether it's ceiling cans or, or chandeliers, and you want that to be as low as possible so that you have soft light sort of at the level of your base. Got it. Thank you. And um, curious. Um, so you arrive at a party and you're seated or, you know, friend's house. What is the thing on the table that makes you happiest to see? Oh, I love that question. Um, some things that we have done as surprises are to put brightly colored candy on the table. Um, I think a parlor game is fun. We've done menu cards that have like, would you rather, which can be a little scandalous um, and a great conversation starter. Um, things like party masks, um, anything that makes you feel comfortable, anything that's a tool for conversation. Um, and I'm talking specifically about dinners that are, or gatherings that aren't, you know, Thanksgiving with just family, you know, but I, I think if you're in a, a really great mix of people to have some sort of tool to spark conversation is a relief and can be silly and make you smile. Fantastic. Um, Rebecca, how can we follow you? On Instagram, um, I'm Rebecca S. Gardner, and I will be launching an online retail site for entertaining at home um, mid-October. And I'm so excited to share every, every detail, um, mostly on Instagram. So please follow me so that um, I can tell you what's, what's happening. Excellent. Rebecca, your work is so inspiring and, and you've really, um, how would I say, uh, made us all want to uh, get to the other side of this period and, um, and start to uh, celebrate a bit. Um, sure. and, and thank you so much for sharing with, your, with us your absolutely beautiful work. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It was fun. Thank you, Rebecca. So now we're going to learn how to get a little bit better balance in our lives. Um, so Carol Clements is the best-selling author of the book, Better Balance for Life. She has more than 45 years of experience as a teacher of many movements in arts and various techniques. While an undergraduate uh, studying physical education, Carol wrestled with cadavers and dissected muscles, tendons, and fascia, analyzing human movement and later applying this scope to a master's degree in dance therapy. After a career in performing arts, she developed her own method of personal training, specializing in postural alignment and uh, mus uh, uh, assimilating the, her background in mind-body methods from the innovative fields of wellness and fitness. In addition to writing numerous magazine articles related to balance and her book, Carol is a bone health ambassador with the National Osteoporosis Foundation and gives workshops and talks appearing in podcasts and radio shows. Carol, hello. Hi, David. I'm happy to be here to talk about improving balance. We are thrilled to have you. So, um, so tell us a little bit about what we might be able to start doing today to, to better our balance, um, but also um, the, uh, all of the uh, wonderful things that come with it. 
Well, there's a lot of sensory data input that goes into balancing. Your brain with the cerebellum, your vision, the nervous system, vestibular system in the inner ear, your muscles, your bones, and body orienting reflexes, your proprioceptors. And all these systems need to be stimulated to stay functional because balance is a skill. It gets better with practice and it deteriorates without it. And unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we've had a lot of our activities more limited. So you're not getting the incidental balance practice that you normally would. You're not sidestepping down the movie theater aisle to get to your seat or um, many other things. <laughs> Going to a restaurant where the pavement is uneven. So we've got to put some of that balance practice back into your daily life and turn the balance system on. When you're sitting, it's turned off. So I'd like for everyone to stand up and turn their balance system on as a little exploration. You'll stand up and make sure you're near the back of your chair or a counter surface or a wall, sturdy object that you can touch to steady yourself and put your feet directly together, tightly, heel to toe. Now you're gonna put one hand across your chest and the other hand across your chest. Close your left eye, close your right eye, and go inside and feel yourself balancing. There's a kind of a sway. Remember, you can always touch that sturdy surface if you need to steady yourself. So go towards your toes a bit or shift your weight back to your heels or over to the right or over to the left and see that what if you're comfortable with that wavering instability. Now open your eyes and just take your right heel off so that you're standing on one leg. What's your reaction to this imbalance potentially? Tension, fear that you'll fall. We just have to keep practicing balancing. So you can sit down again and just think about what you can do in your daily life. And there's a classic brushing your teeth while standing on one leg. So in the morning, you could put a finger on your kitchen, uh, sorry, your bathroom sink and brush your teeth standing on one leg. And maybe the next week you take the finger off and you can practice balancing that way. Or say you've been sitting in front of your computer all the time, because remember, we're not even going, getting as much socializing. It's in front, that's not in front of the computer. So you stand up every time you're going to text and stand on an imaginary type rope. So you'll put one foot's heel directly in front of the other foot's toes and hold your phone for texting, even with your eyes and practice standing on a tightrope. That's the ultimate balancing act. You could even find a pathway in your home that's clear, like on the way to the kitchen or the hallway to the bathroom and put removable tape down that hallway so that you can walk the tightrope down the hallway every time you go into the kitchen or the bathroom. And at First, it might feel very precarious, but you're turning your balance system on. And it's okay to fall off the tightrope because it's just a piece of tape. You can just step to the side and, you know, keep practicing. You could also walk backwards down the hallway because a lot of balance is agility. And think about it, the coordination of walking forward is heel, ball, toe. But when you walk backwards, it's toe, ball, heel. And you also have a totally different visual orientation. You're not seeing where you're going. So that's an agility sort of drill that you can do easily. Every time you walk down that hallway, try something else. Walking in slow motion is good because you have to balance and control. Often when we lose our balance, it's because an unexpected obstacle is in your path 
and you have to step sideways suddenly, or say a door opens in your face and you have to step backwards, you will have practiced transferring your center of gravity backwards into your balance so that when you had to step backwards suddenly, your body was comfortable with that and could do it. Carol. There's so, lots, yes. Oh, sorry. Um, so wonderful exercises. I'm wondering if you would share what are, so, so we're talking about bound state. What are the, the long-term benefits of balancing our bodies? Well, I'm sure you've seen in the media, there's a lot of uh, um, hype almost about falling as you age. Exponentially, your chances of falling get so much more as you age. So you wanna make sure that you've got the function already going for you. There's a lot of things that can contribute to poor balance gait disorders, poor posture, visual impairments, alcohol, prescription medications, uh, various body mechanics, you know, that could be dysfunctioning, and clutter in your home, or so you need the organization, <laughs> drugs, and wearing the wrong shoes. So I'm going to suggest that we look more at what are the predictors of not falling. <laughs> and there isn't as much research about that, but there is a statistical significance for lower body strength. So muscle functioning in the lower extremities is a predictor of not falling. Those who had that quantification of mobility were less likely to fall at any age. So we're sitting a lot and it's deadening the buttocks because you're sitting on the muscle, you're sitting on the nerve endings. And then even when you stand up, it's deactivated. Haven't you ever been sitting a long time and you, you'll use your arms to stand up or your back or your neck and you put stress in your knees? I'd like for everyone now, before there's any issue about balance or falling, you may not think you have any, to build strength in the lower body. And you don't have to go to the gym to do a squat. So while you're sitting, contract your buttocks muscles. Do you feel how you kind of get lifted up on the contracted muscle? So now place your feet just a little ahead of your chair, scoot to the edge of your chair and contract your buttocks first before you even think about standing up because we've got to get it activated. Then release your head forward, take all your weight on your feet and use that buttocks power to stand up. It's gonna bring your pelvis on top of your legs. So you have multiple opportunities a day going from sitting to standing or from standing to sitting to build lower body strength, which is gonna put you at an advantage for years to come of having that stability. What is, um, Carol, what, this is all such great advice and these exercises are so, so doable. Um, what do you find is the, the thing that most of us do incorrectly? Um, what are we doing right now that is impeding balance? That varies a lot, but I think because of um, shoes and sometimes style, <laughs> we are losing some of that mind to foot control. So here's another exploration. While you're sitting there, just wiggle your left big toe inside your shoe if you have on shoes. And if there's no room to wiggle your toe, your shoes are probably too tight. Then wiggle your second toe and the third. Try to isolate them in the fourth. Now wiggle your fifth toe. This is your mind to foot control. We have just as many neuromuscular pathways from our brain to our feet as we do to our hands. But our hands, we're using dexterity. Again, it's all about practice but we're just stuffing our feet in shoes and not paying any attention. So 
you could even exercise your feet while you're binge watching TV. Just prop your foot, take your shoes off, prop your foot up on the couch or the coffee table and fan your toes apart or curl them under like making toe fists because there's 26 bones in the foot and it's the relaxed um, micro movements of your feet that are an important part of your base for balancing. So if you can get more mobility in your feet, you're gonna have better balance. I think that that would be a good thing for everyone to think more about is are you using your feet when you walk? Are you pushing off the big toe and feeling the roll through the foot? Just get in contact with the floor and your feet for better balance. So, so Carol, what, um, how many times a day do you think we should be doing these exercises? Well, I don't want it to be, um, you know, a chore. So like I said, build it in to whatever you're doing. When you're getting dressed, when you put on your earrings, you could stand right next to the wall and touch your shoulder for balance and stand on one leg and put on your earring. And then after a while, when you feel that your foot is more relaxed and growing into a tripod, big toe, little toe heel, you could not touch your shoulder to the wall. And say you're standing at the kitchen sink, rinsing dishes for your feet. You could do those heel raises just to strengthen the lower body because that's proven to, uh, you know, help with balance problems. What would you say, um, what does a, a balanced body convey? Well, there's a lot to posture and that's a whole other category, but yes, the, the body as a unit is better at balancing. You're not a bunch of pieces that'd be like balancing blocks that are all askew. You need to unify in some structural way those blocks to balance. So I would say start from the top, the head neck relationship. You know, we have been driving and at the computer, watching TV, there's a lot of forward head in our society. So imagine the back of your head is like a helium balloon and it's just floating up and your spine can just be the string falling so that your head neck relationship is up. See, here's no helium in my balloon. Now, if I put the helium in the back of my head, it floats up. So that's a beginning for a posture. Going down, let's say your shoulders. Well, the shoulders, you see people and it looks like their shoulders belong to their neck or their shoulders belong to their chest. Think of the shoulders as belonging to the back. Here's the head of your arm bone. That belongs to your back. And once you have that head neck relationship, it's gonna be easier to draw your arms into your back. Then going on down, there's a lot of postural, you know, you connect your upper body to your lower body with your abdominals in the front. Don't think, oh, I connect my upper body to my lower body with my back. Think you do with your front so that you have more abdominal connection. And then I always say that the secret of youth is a long front body. You, and we'll exaggerate, say the elder who's hinged at the hip possibly even with the cane. That's a shortened front body. How are you going to get that long front body? Well, we were exercising the buttocks before. Remember, we were contracting it. The buttocks is your hip extensor. So you need the abdominal connection to lift your pelvis on top, as well as the buttocks, so that you have a long front body. Carol, this is fantastic advice. The long front body, the helium. Um, the balloon, arms belong the to the back. Head, uh, and and then the, the feet articulate. Uh, tell us about that. How do they articulate? Well, as I said, it's that balancing, which is really a lot of micro movements in the foot. So even right now, you could think, is my... You know what the metatarsal is? It's like the knuckle of your feet, the ball of your feet. 
is the big toe metatarsal down, even just sitting? Sometimes people are too much on the outside of the foot or they might be rolled into the inside. So I always say, think of the tripod, big toe metatarsal and kind of push down into that a little. See how that makes you feel more stable when you push down into the big toe, but keep the little toe down and then draw those heels down, draw your sits bones towards your heels and you're standing in much more stability so that when you walk also, your feet can articulate, pushing off the big toe, flexing the ankle, that will strengthen you so that when you're walking, you're not just tiring yourself out, you're strengthening yourself for better balance uh, when you are in one of those unstable situations I was talking about. And I do wanna emphasize that when you are practicing balancing to make sure it's safe, that you always have something to hold on to so that you can practice safely. Wonderful. Carol, your advice is amazing. This, this um you know, and really inspiring for all of us to invest in ourselves today for tomorrow. Um, how can we uh, follow you? And I know uh, you also, uh, your book is available as well. Excellent. There is your contact info and your book. Um, Carol, thank you so much for being a part of today. I so appreciate it. And I think thank we all you. do. We've learned so much from you. So I want to thank uh, all of those watching today. I want to thank my guests, uh, Carol, Rebecca, and Kim, uh, for uh, bringing us their fabulous advice and making us all feel good. Uh, to see other Feel Good Beauty videos, you can go to the David Zyla YouTube page and watch them there. Thank you so much for joining us.